right. Well, it's good to be with everybody tonight. Um, we're changing up our dinner and discussion. It's going to be dinner and teaching, I guess, for a little while here. And um, uh, if you guys could do me a favor, if you could just keep me in prayer. Mom Bear knows, man, I'm really struggling right now with my time. I'm just in a million different directions. And so um, I forgot to bring my iPad down tonight, so I'm working off my computer, and this is, feels foreign to me. And so, um, wah, I'm crying. But uh, anyways, um, before we get started, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together, Lord, as we go into your word. Thank you, God, you've given us your word and that, um, that we can look at it and read it and apply it, and, uh, and Lord, see your love and the relationship that you desire to have with us. I pray as we go into this study, Lord, that we would have um, truly eyes to see and ears to hear, and Lord, um, there may be some things that I'm going to share that um, people may have never heard before, or that may um, go against what they believe, Lord, and it's, um, it's not about that. It's just about sharing information and allowing others to receive it, Lord, and to, um, and to go before you and, and ask, Lord, for discernment and wisdom. And so, Father, thank you for this time together with my brothers and sisters whom I love so much, and we ask for your presence, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. And the table said... So I'm going to teach Matthew a little bit differently. What do I mean? I'm not going to go verse by verse by verse by verse through Matthew. I'm going to ask you every week to read a certain amount of chapters. Uh, we put out a um, notification yesterday to read the first two chapters of Matthew. I don't know if we're going to get through the first two chapters of Matthew tonight, but I do know that um, that notification went out. And so every week, um, I'm not sure how far we're going to get in this study. And so it's really just more or less, um, we're kind of just flying by the seat of our pants. And uh, so I wanted to tell you that up front because I'm not going to read all the genealogy tonight. And I'm not going to touch on everything about the birth of Jesus. But I'm going to draw out the things that I think are imperative that we understand when it comes to the first chapter and second chapter of the book of Matthew. I titled this the Jewish Gospel of Matthew, and the reason that I, I titled it this way is that it was one of the courses and classes, or classes, whatever you want to call it, that I went through with Dr. Nicholas Shazir. Um, I think he's brilliant. Um, I believe that he has an incredible grasp on Scripture, um, he's fluent in Aramaic and Greek and Hebrew and uh, a couple of other languages. Um, he is a, a Jewish Christ believer, and so he has the essence and the and the uh, of the Torah and the Word, um, the Torah in him. And now he's a Christ follower, and so he's he's just an, an amazing man. He's one of the professors that I study under. So let's get started. So Matthew comes first in the New Testament, but most scholars agree that Mark was actually written first, probably somewhere between 60 and 70 A.D. And Mark is really kind of the groundwork gospel that Matthew and Luke both work off of. Now Matthew was written somewhere in 70 to 80 A.D., Luke in the 80s, not the 1980s, and then John in 90 to 110 A.D. Now, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, they're all called the synoptic gospels. That word synoptic comes from the Greek word for seen together. So in synoptic, you have the word optic in there, which means to see. And it's in a sense that's being used that they all seem to have seen the same thing. They all share basically the same material. Now, Matthew includes 90% of Mark. Now, Mark is the shortest of the gospel, gospels. However, Matthew includes 90% in his, and Luke records roughly about 85%. And as with Luke and Mark, they often use the same exact words, 
and in the same word order. Now, as with all New Testament texts, Matthew is written in Greek. One of the early church fathers from uh, 130 to about 205 A.D. by the name of, of Irenaeus, supposedly had the only first-hand original Matthean gospel in, he, in Hebrew. But if that text ever existed, we do not have a copy of it today. So all of Matthew's manuscripts are written in Greek. And as such, Matthew usually cites out of the Old Testament text from what's called the Septuagint. Now the Septuagint is the Jewish-Greek translation of the original Hebrew Bible, and it was compiled in around the 3rd to 2nd century BCE, so about 300 to 200 years before Christ. Now, scholars are somewhat divided on where Matthew was written. Some believe it was written in, this, in the uh, uh, country of Syria and in the city of Antioch. Matthew 4.24 contains a reference to the gospel message spreading throughout Syria, and it's uniquely only in, in Matthew's gospel. Ignatius of Antioch, who was an early believer, in fact, he was an early believer just a few years after Jesus' death, was one of the earliest Christian writers. And many years later, in some of his writings, he, had, he cites from Matthew's gospel after Matthew's gospel has been written. So really, due to the chronological proximity of Ignatius' writings and those of Matthew, scholars speculate that Ignatius had early access to Matthew's gospel since he lived in Antioch and therefore pointing to Matthew being written in Antioch in Syria. But there is another possibility on this writing. Could have been in northern Israel. Since the Gospel of Matthew has a particular focus on the area of Galilee, we're going to see this numerous times as we go through the book of Matthew. Because of this, I think it's more plausible that the book was actually written in northern Israel. Okay, but either way, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, you can divide over this or divide over that. But here's the bottom line is that northern Israel and Syrian Antioch were part of the Roman province that was called Syria, Palestina. And so in reality, either area would be correct. Now, most scholars date Matthew somewhere within the latter third of the first century, 70 to 100 A.D. As I said, most think it was in probably the 70s. And based on what I've studied and what I've read over the last probably year and a half to two years, I would probably place it more about 75 A.D. or C.E. So that's kind of an introduction to the book of Matthew. So let's look at how Matthew's gospel starts out. In the beginning of his gospel, and this is so key because we look at the genealogy in, excuse me, in Matthew chapter 1 and we tend to skip through it. I know that I do because you don't want to read all the names. But there's significance in the first verse because it's going to tell us who Jesus is and it's going to tell us what Jesus' mission was. So Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, it says, the book of of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Matthew is going to start his gospel with a genealogy, and it's the genealogy of Jesus. So let's look first who Jesus is, right? Matthew writes, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus was his name. Christ was his title. In the Greek, it's Christus. In the Hebrew, it's Misha, which means Messiah or anointed one. So it's a title. It's not like Christ was his last name. It's not like you have Joe Smith and Smith is his last name. Christ was his title. And so, in essence, you could easily read the book, uh, the fir or I should say the first verse of Matthew as the book of genealogy 
of Jesus Messiah. He's our Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the one who is going to come and lay down his life. And so Matthew wants to make it clear in the first verse that this is him. This is the one. This is the long-awaited one that Israel has been waiting for. Now, it also says in verse 1 that he is the son of David and the son of Abraham. And so we need to look at what this means. Why does, they, why do they, does Matthew bring up the son of David and the son of Abraham? Okay? Well, as for the son of David, right? It was imperative that the Messiah was going to come from the tribe of Judah and be in the Davidic line. What was prophesied is that Jesus was going to be from that tribe and that he was going to be a descendant of King David. As far as saying that he is the son of Abraham, Matthew here is identifying Jesus as being a Jewish descendant of Abraham. Abraham was the father of the, of the covenant with Israel, right, that God promised. And he's identifying Jesus as being Jewish here. Very important as we go through Matthew's gospel. Now, I want to focus closer on two sons, one from David and one from Abraham. If you remember, David and Abraham both had famous sons. Now, the famous son of David was Solomon. And he's the recipient of everlasting royal blessing. Now, if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 12, it says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, this is God speaking to David, I will raise up your offspring after you, hey, who shall come from your body. This is going to be his son. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be to him a father. And he shall be to me a son. So David is promised that he's going to have this son who is going to build his house, or the, the Lord's house, which is the temple, and he does. But in this, God tells him that I'm going to establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, how is that possible if Solomon is dead? Well, here's what you need to understand. This fits well with how Matthew is going to present his gospel concerning Jesus as, as the Son of God, right? And talking about him being a son to the Father in heaven. What, Jesus, what Matthew is saying here when he says that Jesus is the son of David is that Jesus is the, for lack of a better word, the Solomonic recipient of the blessing in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is the one whose throne is established forever, and he's getting all of the blessing that David was told was coming in Samuel chapter 7. In essence, Jesus is a new Solomon. He's the new king. He's the new recipient of all the blessings that God has promised. Secondly, we see he's a son of Abraham. Who was Abraham's favorite, or, or not favorite, but who's, who was his famous son? Isaac. Isaac was his famous son. He was the one who was almost sacrificed, right, in what is called in Jewish tradition, a kara, or the binding of Isaac. And you can read that in Genesis. So in essence, Jesus, being the son of Abraham, being Jewish descent, is now going to go even further than Isaac for his father in heaven by submitting and being sacrificed for the sin of mankind. So we see in this verse, this first verse, his kingship and his mission. His kingship because he came from the line of David. 
And like Isaac, who was going to be sacrificed, right, being a son of Abraham, that Jesus was going to go not just to the place of binding and then a goat was going to come and take his place, but rather he was going to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashan, and Nashan the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. So moving along, we start to get into this lengthy ge genealogy that's going to take us all the way, I think, to chapter almost, what, four, 19, I think, or verse 19, I should say right? And it appears boring, but there's nuggets that we need to bring out in this genealogy, and especially in these first few verses. We see in this verses, these verses the mention of Gentiles. Now, Matthew makes a point of Jesus' Jewishness by relating him to, the, to, to Abraham, right? But now, now in the genealogy, Matthew is going to bring out Gentiles. And I want to highlight some names. Let's notice a few. There was Judah, who was the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, right? Tamar is a name I want to focus on. Boaz was born by Rehob, right? Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. So you have Rehab and Ruth, both Gentiles. And then it says, and David the father of, of uh, Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Now in the original manuscripts, the word the wife is not in there. It was added later. It actually said, and the fa David the father of Solomon by of Uriah. So here's the thing. Why are these names here? Because there are some names in the genealogy that are missing. And I'll talk about those next week. But why these names? Well, though the Bible does not say that Tamar's ethnicity is, is Jewish or not, in Genesis 38, simp, uh, Second Temple Jewish tradition saw her as a Gentile. Remember what I told you some time back. You had the written Torah and then you had the verbal Torah. In the verbal Torah, this is when they would pass down stories and things about people and, and, and descendants and stuff like that. In the verbal Torah, Tamar had, was a Gentile. And Matthew understood this. Then you had Rehab. Who was she? Anybody remember? Yeah. She was a Canaanite, right? Remember when the spies were, were, were spying out the land? She helped the Hebrew spies. She, she helped them out. And she said, remember me. Remember me. And they did. She was a Gentile. Ruth. She was a Moabite. She bound herself to Naomi, her mother-in-law, and the people of Israel. She was a Gentile. Uriah, what was he? He wasn't Jewish. He was a Hittite. He was a Hittite. He was a, he was a, a, a Jewish convert, right? He, he converted to, Jewish, to Judaism. And here's the thing about this guy. He was an upright and righteous man who refused David's attempt to get him to sleep with his wife Bathsheba and cover up David's adultery. So here's the point. All these Gentiles were righteous and did righteous things for the nation of Israel. 
Why is this important? Because Matthew's story, his gospel, is deeply Jewish. He's concerned with all things Jewish. We're going to see this as we go through the gospel. Matthew knew Hebrew. He spoke Hebrew. He spoke Greek. He also spoke Aramaic. But this genealogy, church, you got to grasp this, foreshadows the Great Commission in which all Christ believers, Jew and Gentile, are grafted in with Christ Jesus for one purpose, and that's to spread the gospel message and make disciples. It's not as if God sat there and said, you're Gentiles, I don't care about you. We see how God, even in the Old Testament, used Gentile kings for his glory. For instance, when Cyrus was going to uh, release the captives back to Jerusalem, Cyrus was instrumental in doing the will of God in that. Nebuchadnezzar, he was instrumental and doing the will of God by taking Judah into captivity. And so Gentiles have been used by God throughout the centuries. And in this genealogy, we see Jew and Gentile together as a picture of what it looks like to be with Jesus Christ. Beautiful, beautiful picture. Let's go to verse 21. Let's talk about what I love what Dr. Shazier called it, Matthew's thesis. In other words, the statement or the point of his gospel. When you go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, when it says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, it's interesting, as I said, because the the gospel is written in Greek. And so, if... You look at Jesus' name in Greek, it's aisos. And if you look at the word saved or save, that word is sadzo, right? And here's what you've got to understand. In Hebrew thought, as they're putting things together, right, as they're writing things out, things have to always connect. And we're going to see this as we get deeper into the book of Matthew how Matthew is trying to connect the past with the present, the present with the future. So in a sense, the name and the mission, which we talked about earlier, they have to go together with each other, but there's really no connection or relation in the Greek. These words don't have anything to do with each other. Iosis and Zotso have nothing to do with it. But if you take the Greek... And if you put it back in Hebrew, there is a a linguistic wordplay and a relationship that we need to look at here. Because I think Matthew was trying to make a point here. And I think that if you had the opportunity to sit and talk with him or, or, or listen to him, he would begin to take the Greek and he would begin to get it to where we're going to now. If you read what it says, she will bear a son, and then it says, you shall call his name Jesus. The Hebrew word there is Yeshua, right? Then it says, for he will save. The word save is Yoshia. The two words have the same root word in it, Yeshua and Yoshia right? Messiah and save. Now, some people try to take the two and put it together and say his real name was Yahshua Shia. It's not. There's, not. there's never anything that's recorded in that. That's people just thinking they're smarter than everybody else. That's not it. But we see here that these two words have the same root word in it, and it describes who Jesus is. Church, it's so important to understand the language and what each writer's linguistic background is 
because it will help as you begin to dig into things. We go in school, we go from the Greek to the Hebrew. Why? Because you have to understand that when the Bible was written, it's kind of like a Jewish Greek. It's almost like slang, right? So you have the Jewish, it's written like in a Jewish Greek lingo. So you have some, some Hebrew words that are almost kind of like mingled in with the Greek. And so it's important to understand that you have to be able to separate it and see exactly what the wording is. So why is verse 21 the thesis of Matthew? Because everything we're going to encounter in Matthew is built around Jesus' name and his mission. That's what you're going to see. Jesus' name and his mission. Jesus' name and his mission. Jesus never strays from who he is, and he never strays from his mission. Verse 22 of Matthew chapter 1 reads, And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. This is so key that Matthew has this early in his gospel. And this part is going to probably blow your mind. Matthew asserts here that the events in Jesus' early life happened to fulfill the words of the Hebrew prophets. We see this in Matthew chapter 1.22. We see this in Matthew 2.15, Matthew 2.17, and Matthew 23. Now, here's what you need to understand. I'm going to slow this way down. On the surface, fulfillments might look like responses to prophetic predictions. In other words, words that were spoken about Jesus hundreds of years before his birth and then only find their actualization or fulfillment in Christ. But this is not what Matthew's doing. Matthew's going much deeper than this. Here's what you understand. The ideal of fulfill, right, as responding to long predictions is actually more of a Greek notion than Jewish. The Greeks believed in that kind of stuff. Instead, Matthew use, Matthew's use of fulfill reflects the Hebrew word lakeum, lakeum. And here's what the word means. To perform, to uphold, and to do. So according to Matthew, Jesus performs or redoes prophetic history. I'll say that again. According to Matthew, Jesus performs or redoes prophetic history. Think in terms of what I talked about earlier with the redoing of Solomon or Isaac, right? That was a picture of who Christ is. So in other words, this is how you have to think about it. Something happened in the prophet's time, and Jesus redoes it to prove he's the Messiah. Are you with me? Something happened in the prophet's time. So whatever the prophetic word is, it was in that time. But Jesus redoes it to prove he's the Messiah. So how do we know what fulfill means, right? How do we know that it doesn't mean just checking off a box? Whoop, that box is checked. Or the word lakeum, which means redoing or perform or do. Let me give you some examples here. Excuse me. Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. Jesus answered him. Now, if you remember, Jesus is going to the Jordan River, and as he comes to the Jordan River, John the Baptist recognizes him and calls him out and says, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus is going to come to the Jordan River. He's coming there for one purpose. He's coming to be baptized. So Jesus is talking to John the Baptist now, and he says, Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now the word us is John and Jesus. John is, Jesus is talking with John. And what are they doing? They are performing. 
They are doing a righteous act. In other words, they're establishing or performing a righteous act by this baptism. So this is what Matthew means by fulfilling. A second one is this. Do not think I have come, Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Oh, man, this one's a sticky one. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So what does this mean here? Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the Torah, the law. He says, I have come to do it. I have come to do it, to perform it. That's what it means. It doesn't mean the law is gone. It means Jesus came to do it and perform it. And this is important as we go through this book. We've got to grasp this. Let me get even a more precise example. This one's going to blow you away. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 1. Let's start in verse 20. This is Jesus doing, or should I say, redoing Isaiah. It says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place, right, to fulfill what the Lord has spoken to the prophet. Verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, if you have your Bibles, you'll probably have a, like a little side note there that says verse 23 actually comes from Isaiah 7.14. Now, the wrong way to approach this is saying that Mary, conceiving her son, is checking off the prophetic box. Right? That's the wrong way to look at this. The way to look at it is this way that something happened in Isaiah's day historically. Something happened. And that something was done by God. And now Jesus comes hundreds of, year la hundreds of years later, and he redoes the same thing. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 7. Let's go to it. Now to kind of set up what's happening here, you have these these two kings, you have these two countries. You have Syria and Ephraim. And Ephraim was the northern part of Israel after the nation split, after Solomon's reign. And God is going to provide a sign for King Ahaz of Judah in these verses here. Now Ahaz is very worried because Ephraim and Syria, they're coming after them. They're coming down to Judah to destroy Judah and, and to, to literally wipe them out. And Ahaz is worried about this. But God says, don't worry. I'm going to give you a sign that it's going to be okay. So in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 5, we read, Because Syria and Ephraim and the son of Ramaliah has devised evil against you, saying, Let's go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. So we see the plot by Syria and Ephraim, right? We see the plot. But now God is responding to King Ahaz. God's saying, I see the plot. Don't worry about it. I see it. Now jump down to verse 10. It says, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to worry men that you worry my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. 
For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. So what is God saying? God's telling Ahaz that a child will be born as a sign that I got you. His name will be Emmanuel, God with us. And he says, before the, grow, the boy grows up to know right and wrong, which is, that's what just in a few years, the Lord says, Syria and Ephraim will be deserted. They will exist no more. And how does this happen? Three years after this, came, this prophecy came, the Assyrian Empire destroys Syria and Ephraim and takes the northern kingdom in captivity and leaves them desolate. This is where the lost, this, the phrase, the, the, the lost ten t- tribes of Israel come from. They were lost. And here's the kicker. If you go to Isaiah chapter 8, just the next chapter, right? In verse 4, you will see that the prophetess conceives and bears a son. This is the boy mentioned who will be assigned to King Ahaz. This is the Emmanuel. God is with us. Here's the point. This is not a text about Jesus theologically. It's about an event in Israel's history that Jesus is going to redo. When Gabriel comes and tells Mary that you're going to conceive a son and speaks from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It had already happened for the nation of Israel. See, what you need to understand when it comes to Jesus is that everything that happened in the nation of Israel, Jesus is going to redo. We're going to see next week when Jesus came out of Egypt. Well, who else came out of Egypt? The nation of Israel, right? We're going to see how Jesus is a picture of everything that happened in Israel, and Jesus is going to redo it. Why? Because he is establishing himself as the true Messiah. Only Jesus, only Jesus is able to do that. So we, got tw- we have prophecy twisted around, man. We don't get it. It's not checking off a box. It's not any of that. It's understanding that in, in the Jewish thought, it's happened. And now it's just replaying out. But it's already happened. So that's what I have for you tonight. Any questions? I'll try to do my, my best to answer. Okay, a lot of information for you guys, I know. What do you mean? By the genealogy? Yeah, well, by <coughs> how it actually happened. It's supposed to happen. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that's it. Because, again, a lot of what we believe in this room mm-hmm. has come from a Western theology. What do I mean by that? I mean is that... Um, we, we've learned from those who were before us that had separated themselves out from the Jews and Judaism, from the, from, the, from the word, the original language. And as, listen, you can take the Bible and you can make it anything you want. Trust me, that's why you have pre, mid, and post-trib believers. You can make it anything that you want. Exactly. And that's how a lot of us got in what I believe in is uh, strong as a puzzle. Right. And, and right. And a lot of times we make it fit to what we want. Mm-hmm. We want it to look this way. We want it to fit this way. So that's what we do. All I'm doing for you guys is giving you information and you can go and decide what you want to do with it. You can decide whether you believe it or you don't believe it. But what I'm giving you is, is based on the, the original text. 
And you have to understand, when it came to writing the Bible, I'll end with this. There was, there was five things that went into writing the Word of God. Text, culture, audience. Um, I'm blanking right now. Text, culture, audience, um, language, right? And, and, uh, and the land. The land is so important. The land has everything to do with what's being written, but we don't spend any time studying the land and understanding the land. What's the significance of Galilee? What's the significance of the, the Dead Sea? What's the significance of the Red Sea? What's the significance of Sinai and all those types of things? We're going to see that when Jesus goes and, and has the Sermon on the Mount, it's a picture of what's, what Moses did on Mount Sinai. So again, Jesus replaying, redoing what's already happened with the nation of Israel. So anyways, thank you guys for being here, and uh, we'll see you guys next week.